Father God, as we come to you, as we open scripture together, as we consider some of the issues that we've just been thinking about, I really pray that your spirit will uh, bring your truth to life. You will enable us to see and to understand. You will enable us to discern what is right and what is wrong. And to do what we can to build your kingdom here, to grow the values and the principles that, that you, Jesus, taught us. Lord, open our hearts, open our ears to hear. If there's anything I say which is not of you, I pray that it just passes us by and we don't hear it. But where there is truth, Lord, that has come from you, I pray that you would speak through me and into our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, as, as I said uh, uh, to, um, to Amelia and Adam, I am a white male, and it is probably the least oppressed type of person in the world. And, and as, as this, um, these protests have been happening over these past uh, two, three weeks now, I've kind of thought, well, what, what have I got to say? What have I got to contribute as someone who this really doesn't affect directly? And... I'm also someone who likes to reflect and to pray and to think before making my mind up. And so I've done that. I've listened uh, to things from all different perspectives and trying to hit, form a picture of what's happening and, and what our response should be uh, as church. And you know what? We are in a, an area of Liverpool which is not particularly diverse. Um, as a church congregation, we reflect that. We're not particularly diverse. But there is still something that we can say and that we can do. Um, and really what I've been trying to do is, is to filter the voices because there are so many voices out there. Some of them are definitely worth listening to and some of them really aren't. And yet ultimately what it comes down to is that there is only one voice worth hearing and that is the voice of our God. And so having spent some uh, time in, in scripture, this is where I think I'm at. Uh, I think first of all, we need a picture of what God thinks of us. And that's given to us right at the beginning of scripture right in the middle of the creation story. So in Genesis chapter one, the very first book of the Bible, right at the start, verses 26 to 27, this is what it says. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. As God's created people, we learn a couple of things. First of all, if we are created by God, then there are no mistakes. No one is here by accident. We were imagined and crafted by a creative genius. And God is equally proud of all of his creation with our different skin tones, hair colours, eye colour, uh, size of our nose, size of our stomach, size of our feet, whatever it is. In God's eyes, there is nothing and no one that he has created that is better than anything or anyone else. Uh, when we sang that, those lines, uh, let me all your love accepting, it reminded me that if if we act in any kind of way that suggests that the love of God is not quite the same for everyone, then that is deeply sinful and is a rejection of God's love. And we look like God and we need to get it that way around. We are made in God's image, which means whatever we look like, we are a reflection of what God looks like. The problem, though, is that we often get this the wrong way around. We tend to look at ourselves and think God looks like us, which is why most depictions of Jesus that we see are of a white man, except Jesus wouldn't have been white he'd have been a bit darker because he was a Middle Eastern man. But it's easier for us to relate to. We think of him as white. And that suggests that God looks like us. But that's an issue of image because actually we should be looking at the vast array of colours and cultures that we see and saying, wow, we look like God. Collectively, we look like God, which tells us that God is hugely diverse. So that's the first thing. We're created equally, loved equally, and each of us is unique in how we reflect what God looks like. And as Colin shared, that image of the body, we are all different. We all have different roles, but we are equally important. And if one of us is not working, if one of us is suffering in that image of the body, then everyone does. 
And the second point from that uh, creation story is that from this place of equality in creation, equality under God, humans have managed the world in such a way that there is inequality. So those verses tell us that we were given rule over creation and unfortunately we have ruled with inequality, which is not a reflection of God. And this looks like poverty and homelessness, famine, discrimination, prejudice, snobbery, greed, third world versus first world, access to healthcare, opportunities to progress and advance. And very often it is according to someone's race, their ethnicity, which will lead to how much they experience those inequalities. There are huge inequalities across the world. And sadly, racism is one of the worst because it affects so many other areas of life. And yet, throughout scripture, we see an imperative, a command, a call, an urging to reach out and show practical love to those in need. And there are so many examples of this throughout the Old and New Testaments that it's, it's hard to know where to begin. But perhaps those verses in Matthew 25, when Jesus calls us to feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty, clothe the naked, visit the sick and reach out to those in prison. Why? Because when we do those things for the, for the people we come across, we do them for Jesus himself. And there is a clear sense that loving people in need in practical ways is a sacred, worshipful act. And right now there is a surge of understanding and reflecting that black people across the world have been subject to oppression by white people in particular. And slowly but surely, more and more white people are stopping and reflecting and recognising that our wrong treatment of people of colour doesn't just go back to slavery, but in fact is still rife in the systems and structures and the hearts of the modern world. Jesus' mum, Mary, on hearing the news that she, who was an unmarried, an unmarried teenage girl, was to bring the saviour into the world, spoke the words we call the Magnificat. And it includes these lines. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Mary recognises that God, in reaching out to her in her humility, is displaying her, his character a passion for lifting up the lowly, levelling the playing field, promoting the unlikely ones to positions of honour. That's how God works. He doesn't value earthly status. Look at the ragtag bunch of misfits that he chose as his disciples. Jesus chose people who were not the creme de la creme or the elite or the qualified. Quite the opposite. God hates inequality and he loves to bring the downtrodden up. I had a really interesting analogy this week. It was a, a black activist called Kimberly Jones, and she compared the struggle of people of colour to a game of Monopoly. She said, imagine that black people were asked to play Monopoly on behalf of white people. And so they play, they go around the board, buying up the streets, building the houses and the hotels on them. But it's all on behalf of white people. And that's what happened during slavery in the United States and over here where white people built up their wealth by trading and using black people for profit. Then Kimberly says, imagine that hundreds of years later, those same uh, people of colour who were playing Monopoly on behalf of white people are told they can now play for themselves. So they start at Go, they collect £200, but the first space they land on is already owned with a hotel on it, and so they have to pay rent. And before they know it, their money's gone. And because all the properties have already been bought and built on, it's not impossible to play the game. They can play, but they're joining a game that's well established and playing against players who've already built up such wealth that it's almost impossible to compete. And I thought that was a really helpful illustration. It reflects the deep frustration of uh, black communities trying to make their way in the world and perhaps helps to explain some of the scenes of protest we've seen over the past couple of weeks. And as we've just discussed with Adam and Amelia, um, there are issues with those protests. Rioting and looting is wrong. It's damaging. But we have to look at it in the context of why. Why is it happening? 
The vast majority of those protest protesting that Black Lives Matter are doing so peacefully and from a place of passionate concern based on the experience of the struggles that they've been subjected to. Sadly, there are those who just like to rebel and have come on, uh, tried to come under that banner just so they can cause anarchy and chaos and mayhem and act violently. We saw yesterday, in fact, how far right protesters used the, the protest as an opportunity to bring more violence to the streets. There will always be people who take advantage of these opportunities and they shouldn't be allowed to drown out the message. I... Uh, came across these verses in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you've got a Bible in front of you or with you, please do turn to it. It's, uh, it's really powerful. It's really important and significant. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the first five verses. And it's Paul talking here. He says, By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold towards you when I, when I am away. Interesting, Paul saying, yeah, I, I'm much braver when I'm writing a letter than I am when I'm face to face. And it's often the case, isn't it? When we're face to face with someone, it's often more difficult to be honest and direct. Um, but behind a, a letter or a text message or an email, it's easier. I beg, that, I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We do not live by the standards of the world. We do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Those are powerful words. And the message uh, version also adds further power to that the message uh, translation says and now a personal but most urgent matter i write in the gentle but firm spirit of christ i hear that i'm being painted as cringing and wishy-washy when i'm with you but harsh and demanding when at a safe distance writing letters please don't force me to take a hard line when i'm present with you don't think that i'll hesitate a single minute to stand up to those who say i'm an unprincipled opportunist then they'll have to eat their words the world is unprincipled. It's dog eat dog out there. The world does not fight fair. But we don't live or fight our battles that way. We never have and we never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entire massively corrupt culture. We use our powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies, tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience into maturity. When I read those words earlier this week, I was really struck by their relevance to this moment in history. This is a moment where, like, as followers of a, of a God of justice... We get to put the tools we've been given into action. It reminds me of a Bond, James Bond movie. You know, when Bond goes to visit Q and he's get, he gets shown all the gadgets and gizmos and weapons that, that have been designed for him to use. And then later in the film, he actually gets to use them. Well, this feels like our moment. We have the tools to tear down the ideas and arguments, the philosophies and the beliefs that simply do not match with what God says about what he's created. And this includes looking prayerfully at ideals that we might hold on to and challenging them where they don't align with God's view of what he's made. Whether that be socialism, capitalism, feminism, whatever it may be, no matter how virtuous and valuable these ideals may seem, we need to be ready to view them through God's eyes and to call out those elements which are out of sync with the kingdom that Jesus preaches. Now, unlike those other ideologies, racism has no redeeming features. It's about as far removed from God's ideals as it's possible to be. And just as Jesus dealt with who and what he encountered there and then, as he came across them, so we too are called to, as followers of Jesus to respond to these voices who are crying out for justice and equality, because they're the ones who are experiencing it and encountering it. And they're the ones we're coming across here and now. 
Frankly, any Christian not actively seeking to snuff out racism where they see it becomes part of the problem. Dr Angela Davis, who's a black political activist and professor, says that it's not enough to be not racist. We have to be anti-racist, which sounds hard, doesn't it? I can sort myself out. I can try and make sure that my attitudes are, are, are equal and fair and that I treat everyone the same. But when we come across it, it's difficult. When I spoke to Amelia last week, I said, what would you say to us as white people? And she simply said, just speak to your friends. Tell people that you know about what is the right way to live and to be. We can be encouraged by the fact that Jesus' kingdom is an upside down kingdom. It doesn't start from the lofty positions of power. It starts with you and me and the relationships that we have with each other. That's where the change begins. It's strange, isn't it, that these powerful tools we have are as simple as speaking to someone about an attitude they show or a comment they make. But that's the beauty of God's way. It's simple and it's personal and it's relational. It takes courage to live like that. Courage that can only come from the Holy Spirit. But we are seeing things beginning to change and we have to be at the centre of that movement. I've heard people use the parable of the lost sheep to describe um, how we should be at the moment. That that the idea of we're the, we're the ninety nine, we're the ninety nine sheep who who are who are okay and safe, and and we need to go after the the, the lost sheep. Except the chat, the issue with that parable is it ends with Jesus saying there is such joy when one person repents, which suggests that that lost sheep is not lost uh, and in danger, but they're actually rebelling and uh, acting sinfully, and that's perhaps not the uh, the issue that we're encountering right now. I think a better parable would be that of the Good Samaritan, where a Samaritan man who had long been at war with those of a more established Jewish heritage, these were people who did not like each other at all, reached across cultural and ethnic barriers and simply showed love to someone in need. Why? Because the opportunity was right in front of him and he was in a position to help. And Jesus' words at the end of that parable are simple, challenging, but simple. He says, go and do likewise. Reach across cultural and ethnic barriers. Show love because the opportunity is right in front of us and we are in a position to help. Go and do likewise. Perhaps we could stand where we are. Um, maybe in your living room, in your kitchen, wherever you're... Um, watching and engaging this morning stand Father God we acknowledge that we are not perfect we may hope to be we may wish we were we may feel like we're not that bad but we know that we often in so many ways, fall short of the standards you have for us. And it may be that each of us in different ways have acted or thought or spoken in ways that do not honour the fact that we are all created equal by a loving creator God who sees us as exactly the same. But that's been true in the church. That's been true in uh, individual lives. It's been true in systems. It's been true in uh, both overt and discreet ways. And Lord, we want to say sorry for those times where we have fallen so far short of loving people equally. And I pray that you'll help us to discern to hear your voice speaking out above all the others and enabling us to see those who are in need those who we can reach out to to show love to support and encourage not because we want to show how good we are and how woke we are but because we want to show your love in action
Lord, give us your ears to hear. Give us your eyes to see. By your spirit, give us your courage to act. Lord, let us seize this moment to make lasting change, to bring more of your kingdom values and principles into being right now. And at the same time, where there are political ideas, political perspectives and standpoints, where there are uh, value systems and philosophies that we subscribe to, help us to also look at those critically. And where there's anything in there that is not of you, let us push that to one side. Always seeking to prefer you and to prefer others. As we finish, we're going to sing. We're going to sing, uh, build my life. Worthy of every song we can ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we can ever bring. And it speaks of um, being led in God's love to those around us. So again, it's an opportunity to respond in song and prayer to what God's been saying to us this morning. So let's do that now. <laughs>